Another episode of Surly Voices here on WMNF Tampa 88.5. I'm Liz. I'm one of your hosts. My co host, Donna, is joining me by Zoom. How are you, Donna? I am good. Awesome. Good morning. Yes. So, we got so many things to talk about today. Um, where do you want to start? Um, I think that the big conversation are the, uh, is the new Trump indictment. Yes. And, of course, Lizzo responded to uh, the accusations, says they're as unbelievable as they sound. So we'll get into that. Yeah. So uh, I'll give this early disclaimer up top. The opinions on Surly Voices are those of Surly Voices and not those of WMNF.org. Um, and so if you guys want to join the conversation, give us a call at 813-239-9663. You can send an email to dj at WMNF.org or you can text to 813-433-0885. So the Trump indictments, oh, he's he's now up to, oh, 79, 78, 79, uh, 78 felony charges. <laughs> <laughs> if go big or go home. Yeah, really. I have the most felony charges. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tremendous. Tremendous, <laughs> tremendous, <laughs> very big. Um, and so three separate indictments, possibly a fourth coming along um, out of the Georgia election tampering. But surprisingly enough, he still leads the pack of Republican contenders for the presidential race. In fact, he was uh, he took a, a dinner meeting with some Fox executives and they were trying to co coax him into attending a debate with the others. And he's like, no, why? That, that would be stupid of me to do that because, you know, I'm leading. If they take a shot at me and they and it lands, then, you know, I might lose some points. So, no. Um so the yeah it's and and I fully expect that he will you know they'll they'll stick with him until he's actually in bars and then still may stick with him even though he's <laughs> in bars right so I had a thing happen to me yesterday I was uh scrolling twitter which I never do um I think that there was some uh, old tweets in the Lizzo uh, article, and it led me to um, Twitter. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was showing me, like, updates and things. You know, I'm just not a Twitter person. It's just all people do all day long is just argue with each other. Right. And so I so scrolled across something that says Trump, the 45th president of the United States, uh, has died. He was 77 years old. And so immediately... I go, my heart sank, right? I can't explain it. I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Uh, and I go and I look and there's nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So this is somebody trolling the internet, right. as people do. And then I thought, and I said, I'm going to ask our, our audience on the radio tomorrow. If Trump died, what would we do? We've spent... 2015 until 23, what is it, eight years now? Yeah. Eight years now, using him basically as the face, uh, like at the gun range, right? He's, he's our target <laughs> factor. You know, it's, I mean, I mean, figuratively. I mean, figuratively yes. Right? 
Uh, and so I don't want anybody to call in and say we're talking about gun violence and suggesting it on the air. Um, but if he was no longer in the picture for a number of reasons, um, he was ill, he was uh, un un unable to stand trial for these uh, indictments, um, what would people do? Uh, what would we do about the 2024 election? Um, who would we blame for the nation's ills, many of which were exacerbated by his tenure but not created? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's what it, what it what it told me, and it was completely unexpected, is that we have no plan. We Americans, not any party, have no plan for the future of this country now. I know people will argue with me because one of the things that came up last night in a discussion that I had was we have to think strategically, plan long term. And I had to remind people, listen, it took a lot of years for Republicans to overturn Roe v. Wade. Right. Uh, it took a lot of years to wage war on education closing schools, moving around teachers, underpaying faculty and staff. It took a lot years, like over 50 years right. to get up to this point where our education system is hanging on by a thread. So the point is, and I don't want to I don't want to go off on a tangent, but the point is I don't see uh centrist dims uh and definitely not people that are to the left of the progressives as having any sort of plan other than just trying to keep the floaties on, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And, and see, that's the huge difference between Democrats and Republicans. Republicans, they, they make the plan, they stick to the plan, they commit wholeheartedly, they have awesome branding, and then eventually they get their way. Um, and yeah, the Democrat, the Democratic side doesn't seem to really have any idea except just talking about, oh, woe is me. You know, there's racism. Oh, woe is me. No, mm -hmm. why don't we, why don't the Democrats come up with a solid plan about what they want to see happen in the country and then execute it? Because first we would have to prioritize our position and then, and agree on a few things. And in, that's that's what you have to do in order to execute a plan, right? In order to even even develop a plan, the mm -hmm. first thing you have to do is decide what you want to address. What are your priorities? What are your concerns? Uh, what's the most important? And I can tell you that all of the individual camps inside of this party are going to tell you that their issue is the issue that should have right. primacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's like herding cats because <laughs> Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. And so, you know, it's it's I think that we have to think about it. And the thing that I would say to folks that are listening is we have to really think about what it is that we want to do. I think that the thing that unites us all here uh, is the economy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our issues uh, even racism, like I've always said this on air, is that the chief ism is capitalism yes. and that all the other isms serve it. Right. And so if we could just address the economy and then but we could think about that, too. There are people who will say, no, we have a moral crisis in this nation and we must address it. And unless we do that, nothing else will work. I mean, there are people who are going to say that. Oh, of course. So, but, yeah. But I think that logically. Uh, because misogyny, because racism, because homophobia, gender roles uh, that give rise to homophobia uh, and misogyny, that those things are all under the cat can be filed under the category subcats of capitalism. Yes. Well, it, it, capital all roads lead back to capitalism. And right. so, yeah. And so there's never going to be a time in this country anyway that that we we are not under a capitalistic system. Right. Right. Um so it it kind of makes it hard <laughs> when the game is rigged from the start. But but one thing I think we could and the the Democrats, one thing the Democrats should be all able to get on board for 
is uh, universal health care for anybody. Every every citizen has universal health care. Now, well, honey, let me tell you this. I know. <laughs> I, I was on a thing last night. It's like a clubhouse thing where everyone's talking. You can see everybody's picture and you can raise your hand. It's like just like clubhouse, but it's a Twitter format. And I, I mean, I was there for a while. This went on for a while. And uh, shockingly, <laughs> not. <laughs> People were yelling and expletives at each other, and they couldn't agree on whether or not it was important who was in the White House um, for Medicaid and what services and depths that Medicaid reached. Uh, People couldn't agree on the end of the COVID outbreak period. Uh, They couldn't agree that there was one guy from New York that said, oh, Medicaid, yeah, that's a problem because Medicaid doesn't do enough. And I was like, that's not even the conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. The conversation is about if you have um, goals that you would like to, you know, achieve um, as a person in the political arena, did it matter more? Uh, Did your governor or your uh, federal officials matter more? And the girl who was talking, she said that it mattered more who the president was for Medicaid because it's a federal program. And I took umbrage with that. Yeah. Because I thought the, the president can't give you Medicare <laughs> right. or Medicare because if he could, it had been done already. Right. You know, Obama could barely give us the uh, ACA. Exactly. And and so, had to fight fight hard for it. I can remember going out stumping for that. And it's like, yeah, this is... This is actually absolutely critical. Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a big ball of yarn. It's a big knot. And, and if, pe- if we can't agree that the economy is a thing that we should probably attack with health care, the things that we need to sustain our life around, the housing crisis, this is food, clothing, shelter, health care. Well, and and with universal, see, this is where you we have to appeal to the capitalists. It's like if you give universal health care, it improves the health of the working class, and therefore it benefits capitalism. So it's a no brainer, right? Healthy people can work, <laughs> right? Healthy people, work, right? And they do good jobs because they're healthy, because they can think clearly, because they are eating a balanced diet, because they're strong, right? And I've actually talked to uh, to Republicans about universal health care, and their takeaway is, no, universal health care, no, health care is a luxury, a privilege. <laughs> and, oh, my God, I, I nearly just melted like the witch in, in The Wizard of Oz, you know, it's like, okay, so, what? <laughs> so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I got so excited when I thought about this, not excited in a good way. Uh-huh. Uh, I saw a picture of Sarah Huckabee Sanders and some uh, other people in uh, Kentucky, no, Arkansas. Is it Arkansas? Arkansas. Arkansas. And they uh, have made a law that school children don't need a work permit. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so they're they're skipping this is how they solved the the issue of unhealthy workers. They um they get child labor. Yeah, cuz they're have, Those be kids healthy. are strong. Let's put them to work. Yeah. The new one. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, so wow. That's how that's how they're responding to these times. Yeah, wow. it's amazing. You wouldn't even think that's good. And there's so many things happening. A police officer was killed in North Dakota the other day. Uh, He was only 23 years old. Um, And uh, I say that with reverence because, you know, he was not much more than a boy. Right. And I read it in Breitbart. (laughs) Breitbart. I didn't mean to laugh after saying that, right? Because, you know, life is sacred. But he... It was, I read it in Breitbart. It just comes up. It came up in my thing. You know, you see all these news stories. And it, and it was in Breitbart. And the right 
if we if the, if people on the left are talking about Lizzo and what does this mean for feminism, for the body positivity, fat positivity movement over here, the conversation over there is this police officer being killed and how it's not being carried by right wing media. Now, I say all of this stuff, even seemingly divergent uh, topics, because this country, there is no headline that captures us all mm-hmm. when people on the right see that Trump. Uh, is indicted. That to them is a witch hunt. Uh, he is a uh, political, um, uh, he's being persecuted because he was a great president and the left didn't appreciate it. This country is so deeply divided. So I think that the the, the divisions inside of the Democrat Party are just a reflection of the larger conversation, the, the the greater discourse, is that we're just divided on every possible matter. How did we get here? That's a good question. Let me let me read some emails um, from our listeners and then we'll we'll come back to that because I ha- I have thoughts. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Dave from Sarasota. Hi Dave. Uh, Donald J. Trump is scared of Christie in debates because he knows Trump and family. Also, if Trump dies, it it will be one less wannabe dictator running. I support Med for All. Vote everyone. I'm going with progressive Dems. Thanks for writing in, yeah. Dave. I like that. Yeah. I like that, Dave. Okay. Jack... In Ellington says, I am not a member of any organized political party. I am a Democrat. And it's attributed to Will Rogers. So good good one, Jack. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. How did we all become so divided? I would argue that the division started in the 1800s. And it, it arose... With you know, it, it came to a head with the Civil War, which for those of you who, who are educated in the South, like I was, the Civil War was not about economic issues. The Civil War was about slavery. So that's when it started. That's when the nation became divided. And it's carried, yeah. And then afterwards, after um, the Union won the Civil War, you, they didn't outlaw Confederate flags or, or, you know, in other words, if you compare how America acted to the outcome of the Civil War to the way Germany reacted to the outcome of World War II, it's entirely different. You go to Germany, you don't see flags with swastikas. It's against the law. You don't, you don't hear people talking about uh, glorifying Hitler. Of course, I'm sure there's little pockets of Nazis somewhere, but in general, nobody in the public talks about it. Um, And so in the United States, once the Union won the war, you know, here comes, you know, the loser Confederates and and they're they're very uh, they're burning grudges. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I I heard growing up about. Oh, you know, the, this is terrible, Yankees, you know, carpetbaggers, all this kind of stuff. And and I don't doubt that times were really hard in the South immediately after the war. But that got passed down generationally. And and it manifested itself with the Jim Crow laws and, and segregation and all the horrible things. And and that that's what we're still stuck with today. We are fighting a war from from century ago. Centuries. Yeah, I mean, even before the Whigs opposed Andrew Jackson <clears throat> ahead of the Civil War, um, there was internal division. I mean, right. this, this country didn't even, there was never a time. I mean, and I think that's normal and maybe it's healthy, uh, but where we are now, we literally can't get anything done. And a lot of people are suffering as a consequence of that. So speaking of suffering and capitalism, and um, one of the um, the greater examples of what um, hypersexuality, uh, capitalism, and narcissism uh, have created the all-American institution of Hollywood. 
Did you like that segue? <laughs> <laughs> that was really good, Donna. I got to say, you're, you're getting like some of our listeners who sneak things in. And it's like, boom, here we go. <laughs> Hollywood. <laughs> right? I mean, what more American institution than Hollywood, right? It's all tinsel and pretense and ego and money. Yes. Right? And nothing done for love or for, you know, the sacredness of human life. So Lizzo, um, for those of you who don't know, Lizzo is a 35-year-old American um, singer. Um, She hails from Minneapolis, although I do believe she uh, is, uh, her birth certificate would say Colorado. Um, she was a protege of Prince. Um, she had a, uh, she's been, I would say she's been around since her late teens, early twenties, uh, where she had some, uh, interesting, uh, songs that she produced herself on the internet, uh, until her, um, this is, uh, what is the name of this song? DNA. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2000 and. 1819 um, came out in 18 and gained uh, prominence on, in 2019. She was on the Grammys. She was new. I mean, think a black Megan Trainer. Uh, all about that base. Oh uh, no, that's a that is a total diss to Lizzo. Megan Trainer well, was a one hit wonder, and I don't even know, you know how she got to be where she was. <laughs> M- Megan Trainer is still around. She was married to a producer, music producer. That's ah, gotcha. But when I think about that, I think about she was early body positivity, uh, plus size woman. Uh, her music was uh, had a little shtick to it. It was fun, a little campy. Uh, that's the similarities that I'm pointing to. Okay. Right. Um, and I, it, you know, even she used the piano in a, in that kind of, um, um, I don't know. It made me think of uh, stage acting, you know? Oh yeah. The way, the way they performed. Okay. So if, and if people don't know who Lizzo is and they don't listen to certain types of music, that would probably work for them. So, Lizzo has been a beacon of body positivity. She has uh, brought kids. She's she's talked against uh, bullying. Uh, There was a big deal that was made of the work that she did in uh, Australia uh, where she sandbagged. uh, And she brought a young girl up on stage who had been bullied uh, for wearing dresses. And she... Uh, soothed her in front of the world and gave this girl her moment and people were crying and it's just Lizzo is so great. I love her. Her concerts, I've been to three, have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. So now, here we are. Uh, It is August. We're barely in August (laughs) 2023. It's been about five years of fame and consistent growth and chart climbing for Lizzo. And she is being sued by three of her former dance backup dancers, uh, two of whom came to her from her reality show that's on Netflix. And now they have alleged that Lizzo um, was sexually they were they were made to engage in sexual activities that was against their religious beliefs, that they had uh, were religiously harassed by their um, the troop leader, um, stage manager. I'll, I'll, I'll get into it here in just a second. But I'm doing all of this from memory because for some reason my notes aren't here in front of me. Right. And, and I, this and all took place in a, in a uh, strip club. Um, well, that was only one thing. The Amsterdam uh, part took place in the strip club, and it's just too salacious to even it's to even say on air the things that these women allege allegedly were forced to uh, have done. They were shamed um, in front of groups, held without their um, permission, against their will, um, and. It is 37 pages wow. of salacious Hollywoodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. And uh, the problem here is 
this is a black woman. Mm-hmm. And, you know, every so often we pick up, we pick a, like, we pick, like, like the way that uh, Republicans pick a victim, uh, Democrats pick their champion or their hero, or their sacred, sacred person uh, group of the day. So in 2016, it was black women. You can't critique a black woman. You can't say, you can't disagree with a black woman. We did that. Like, we did that. Uh, and so now we have other groups that have come forward, and they are not able to be critiqued. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work. But that's not the point I'm making. The point is that Lizzo is coming, she's high on the era of black women are sacred and have been left behind and we're going to center and amplify their voices. And Lizzo became famous in that space. It is very difficult for people to have this conversation down. And Amina talked last week about identity politics being a two-edged sword. And so here we are, hoist upon it. Uh Because people want to have this conversation because we also said we believe women and yes. we said that we support workers that that came up during COVID. You can't critique the workers because they are the ones that are keeping the world going. And we said, we believe women during the me too era at the Zenith of the me too era, women were untouchable. If you said it, it happened. Right. Even if later on we found out that maybe it didn't happen. We believe women. We believe right? women. Yes. Okay. So that indemnity along with the we support workers no matter what Mm -hmm. because they make the world go round is making this conversation very touching though liz yes absolutely and so yeah it's it's a huge quandary because not only do we say believe women we say believe black women listen to black women um, and so if you've got backup dancers that are complaining that they have been harassed, I have not seen the complaint, but I'll look at it after I just heard about it this morning. Um, so, but, so yeah, it's like, who do you, who do you go with? I mean, who do you pick? If, if Lizzo was a man, it would be an easy choice. And now I'm stuck. Yeah. <laughs> the worst part of this is that, and, I, and when I was looking at the allegations, you know, as they were listed, I've read probably for two hours, you know, to, to prepare for this, which is why the notes not being here is a little bit of madness. But the um, in in this um, um, lawsuit that alleges it, I hear people saying fat phobia and a lot of people have fixed on that and they're using that to launch a. Uh, uh, a nasty little campaign against plus sized women, mm-hmm. which I don't, I don't like how it's uncovering that. Right, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, if people are responding and they want to hear about it, but what's bothering me here is in those pages, the girl says that she 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 didn't imply. She said that Lizzo made a comment about her weight and implied that she wasn't as committed to her job. And she extracted from that that Lizzo was making fun of her weight. And I thought that it seemed like it was stretched, Uh. but it had stopped the media and Lizzo's public from really taking that, going to town with that. Well, and and what exactly, we have to, you know, discover what the context is because I saw the last time Lizzo came through town, her backup dancers were not, you know, wafer thin. They were all substantially sized people. And so does Lizzo want her to eat more? Is she too thin? I mean, yeah, maybe that's... You know, I don't don't know, but I know that uh, that's a little salacious, right? Like uh, Lizzo is fat shaming her dance, her her plus size backup dancers. Right. And there's sort of a fixation on that point. Uh, when I looked at the point, um, got right down into it, it just seemed like I could see the lawyer. This guy looks like he's a little greasy. (laughs) I I could see this guy being like, thank you, God, for dropping this one in my lap. Yeah, really. (laughs) And I could see him saying, if we come up with 40 pages of the most salacious, 
details. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they're true or not. Right. It it just matters that Lizzo is crucified before the world. We just need a little bit of what Colbert calls truthiness. Mm Mm-hmm. And the media and the internet will take care of the rest. Right. <laughs> and it felt a little bit like that. It's a shakedown is, is what it sounds like. Okay, but wait, though. Until people who were started coming on the internet and saying, hey, I wasn't, I'm not a part of the lawsuit. I want to be clear. Uh-huh. But that was exactly my experience when I was on tour with Lizzo. Oh, that doesn't so, sound good. And that's damning, right? Like, yeah. It's one thing for someone to stand up and say this. Rose McGowan says, you know what? Harvey Weinstein did this to me. But the other 87 people. Right. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, and it's, and it's not, it, people say, I can't believe it. Why don't you believe it? It's just like politics in Hollywood, right? right. That, that right. Kind of, it, these, these arena attract certain personalities. Right. Yeah. Certain types of people become nurses. Certain types of people become lawyers. You know, within a range, it's not, you know, a one size fits all. But you you have to be shaped a certain way to say, hey, I want to be on the screen. I want to be the person holding the microphone. I want the world to say my name. Right. That's a that's an energy. And those folks have enormous pressure on me Mm -hmm. to remain relevant and to stay on top. Right. And I think a person who has a normal, healthy ego could definitely end up becoming a monster in a certain cir- circumstance like that. Right. The power, the fame, the the everything, the clout, the cachet, everything, everything. goes to their, I mean, especially when it takes off as quickly as it did for Lizzo. Because one day you don't hear about her at all and the next day, bam, she's famous and she's got hit after hit. Uh, after hit. Yeah. Especially when you've struggled as a young girl and you've been homeless and you lost your father who was your champion. And then one day, you know, you're on top of the world. And if you're, and like you said, it happened so quickly, it's easy to see how this could happen, how, how Lizzo could have possibly lost sight of the shore. I mean, we're only human, right? Right. And the, every monster is, the, our next, is a next door neighbor, or our son, or our daughter. That's true. Yeah. You're listening to Surly Voices on WMNF. Tampa 88.5. Give us a call at 813-239-9663. You can send an email to dj at wmnf.org or you can text to 813-433-0885. Well, we've we've moved into the Hollywood uh, section of of the hour. So while we're in, I not that um, I want to um, dismiss the Lizzo story. That's something worth following because yeah, I have seen there was a um, a director who was going to do a um, a show about um, Lizzo. She had she had gone to stay with her on tour. So that she could um, she could film Lizzo's life, her process, everything else, and so she herself reported that um, this was the most horrible experience she ever had. She never wanted to work with Lizzo again, um, and she she there was no way that she was going to make a film of of Lizzo because it was just such a horrible experience, um, and so that was really um, disconcerting to see, um, and and that that really kind of you know lends credit to to the allegations of these dancers that have filed a lawsuit. So it's it's really disturbing and it's it's a story to watch. But for now, I want to segue into the actor strike in Hollywood. Um as we know, um the actors joined the writers in their um in their strike. And just so happens the um the president of the actors um union is Fran Drescher, who 
used to play the nanny. If if any of you watched um, cheesy television like I did, um, and so she she's been on screen and everything. And of all the people, you know. I never would have thought of Fran Drescher, but there are also some people talking about, yeah, we're we're technically with our union, but yeah, we're not going to be out and and hitting the picket lines. And so, um, that's that was a surprise for me. What did you think about that, Donna? The the nanny being um, the new face of the actors union. You know, I don't trust Hollywood at all, right? I mean, these person, I, I like Fran Dressler. I like her. Um, I have always liked her. But I don't trust Hollywood. Like, people do things for so many different reasons. Right. You know, and I don't know. I think that she, from outside, from an outside looking in, because I don't have any information about that, from the outside looking in, uh, she cuts a fine figure uh, as uh, their fearless leader. Um, and I think it's, it's a, it's a perfect, she's the perfect person for that space right now. Right. You know, she's a woman. Um, she is, uh, an ethnic minority. Um, she is outspoken and she is a brilliant woman. So from the outside looking in at first glance, I would say that she's a perfect fit for that role. And and yeah, I've I've watched her um, her press conferences and stuff, and it's very. I mean, she she is very effective at you know shaking her fist and and you know making her point, and so very. I think she's done a great job so far. Um, you know what, though, Liz, I'm a, just every time something like this happens, you know, an R. Kelly, what well, we knew about him, a Bill Cosby, a Harvey Weinstein. You know, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, um, every time uh, some, uh, Bill Cosby, I said him, uh, something like this happens, there's this, you know, uh, fall from grace, you know. Mm-hmm. I get a little, I, I become more and more apprehensive about saying this person that if this is great, right? Because you just, you don't know. You don't, you don't know who you're looking The media can tell anyone to be anything. You don't know who you're looking at. Well, that's right. Because that's what they do for a living is they pretend to be other people. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, somebody said that about, they said that about Meghan Markle. You know, she's an actor. Remember, she's an actor. Right. You know? I don't know. Yeah. Who who knows? Who knows? Um, can I just do one thing here before we take another step? Because I wanted to, I wanted to, say something about a little bit more so that I would get into it about this Lizzo thing. Isn't just us gossiping with you on a Thursday morning. Um, this type of activity. So let's say Lizzo did the things they said she did. And so she did them right. Or she didn't do them. Right. The door, door number three, that this has opened up for the George Peterson crowd has been unbelievable. Oh, tell me about it. Okay, so that's the interesting part. I said all of that to say this, that people are now making fun of Lizzo's body. Uh, One of our local attorneys, uh, that I'm not going to say the organization because they don't know immediately who he is, but a local civil rights person that's situated inside of a civil rights organization um, actually was on the internet, on social, saying that we shouldn't allow people to be, um, basically he was calling out identity politics for the fact that we anointed Lizzo as our queen, um, and now that she's fallen from grace, uh, this is a great illustration as to why we shouldn't allow body type, ethnicity, gender, to determine who our heroes are. Hmm. Right. And that was someone, I mean, and that's not like someone out there, this is random that I'm arguing with on the internet. I didn't argue with them. I just said to them, wow, I must have misread you. Yeah. You know? uh, because I didn't expect you to respond to this. First of all, you're an attorney and you know all types of people do all types of things. Right. You, are, you know this. And for you to say that this points to 
all of those other things and indict identity politics and body positivity and fat positivity, right? And yeah. woman's empowerment is wild. But that's not just something that's happening with this individual. If you scroll through the Internet, and my son reminds me all the time, you guys, Mom, it's the Internet. <laughs> not necessarily happening in the real world, right? It's five people on the Internet that's making right. this making fit happen, okay? And so I don't want to go off the deep end. I want to be measured here with this that everyone in the world isn't saying these things are bad. But for me to hear from people who are progressive, so-called progressive, the ire at the, all of these movements, because they've only done good things for people. Uh-huh. Like no one on the right is harmed by the body positivity movement. They just don't like it. That's different from right. racism. You know, it's not the same as, you know, lethal transphobia. And so I got a little confused about uh, the, the way people were, and they were mostly, and I'm going to say it out loud. I know people don't like it when I say it out loud. It was white men and white women. Yep. Who were some, some people who would be politically in the middle and some would be on the far right, and they made it purely political. That Lizzo is an example of why we shouldn't do these things. And it just went across the internet. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've we've had lots of folks come. I mean, I would think, and, and then again, we have to assume we haven't seen the answer and whether she, it's my understanding she vehemently de- denies everything, although, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that these other folks are coming out. I'm going to be interested to see whether the same people who defend the men when they get accused of, of sexual harassment, whether those folks are going to ride for Lizzo as well. That's what I'm waiting to see. Well, you know, from the, from the, the, what they call the whole tap crowd, these are the black men who want black women to submit. We talked a little bit about you know, that in past shows, uh, those guys are saying, you know, the same thing. It, you know, it, people can only diverge so far before they meet again, right? Right. They, you know, it's like a, they call it horseshoe theory, um, that the two opposing, the, the people that are farthest apart eventually converge at a, another point, if you're talking about circular um, ideology. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, right? So from one extreme to the other, and then the twain shall meet. Um, and so I'm hearing black men on the left, on the right, saying the same thing as white men on the right, although if you put them in a room together, they would slaughter each other. Right. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Politics <laughs> makes strange bedfellows. You know, I don't even, in, anymore, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Like, when I look at how many things are happening. My brain does two things. It says, it puts them in little, you know, it taxonomizes. It puts them in little categories, stratifies, um, and makes these like layers, and like little dessert layers. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that it does is it makes it all the same. It says DC equals Hollywood, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it says that the men, the misogynists uh, of Jordan Peterson and Dr. Umar Johnson, you know, the Pan-Africanists, the uh, uh, Afrocentrists are the same. And after I get done taxonomizing all these little systems, then I look at them and I, I, I start to see how they all merge together. It's like a schematic in my brain. That sounds frightening. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, my brain's always been like that. But now when you when you look at the world and all of the things that are happening, yeah, you know, a lot of this stuff is coming from one place: fear, fear, yeah, yeah. fear of the un- fear of the others, fear of the unknown. Um, I got a message from Frank, and it says uh, wants to know where Amina is. A listener wanted to know where Amina was. Amina is has work conflicts today and next week, but she should be here after that. Um, yes, Amina's very much with us, Frank, and she's not going anywhere. So, um, so while we're in Hollywood, let's talk about Disney World or Disneyland or the Disney Corporation and how Ron DeSantis has um, um, 
alienated them to the point where Florida has started losing uh, tourism money. Mm-hmm. Who didn't see that coming? <laughs> you know, what, I, what I don't want to happen, I figured this would all be temporary, but 2026 just seems so far away. Yeah. It seems so far away. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, two turns. It's just it's too much. And I wonder how we recover from, I almost have more questions than answers. I wonder how we recover from, you know, a decade of it. Well, yeah, because he's he's done so much damage already. I mean, how much more can he do? It's always, it, it always frightens me to ask that question, but I think it, it deserves, I mean, he's he's gotten into schools to the point where you're teaching them nonsense and fairy tales. Um, and you can't teach science and history. No, it's nonsense, conspiracy theories, and fairy tales. Um, he's, I mean, there are so many disenchanted teachers in this state and underpaid at that. You know, I, you know, if I were a teacher, I would just say, nope, um, I refuse to teach this stuff, find somebody else. And I think that's what a lot of them have done, um, is, because how and then he wanted to um put in this curriculum and I I'm not overly versed in it um Prager U or something like that curriculum and everybody's like what and I do believe they took a vote on it on, in Hillsborough already and haven't um haven't approved it so it, now we're just stuck with nonsense and fairy tales uh you know I think it's- <laughs> I think that Ron DeSantis and what's happening in Florida is a study in states, right? If yeah. people didn't understand what is meant, now the federal government, we all know, everybody listening knows this, I think, federal government supersedes uh, the state um, um, in regard to enumerated laws. However, we don't think of how dangerous it can become if a group hijacks a state and takes it on a fantastic and story. yeah, and that's exactly what's happened here. I said, but it hadn't been so fantastic for LGBTQ, <laughs> and it hasn't been fantastic for a lot of us women. Yeah, six weeks abortion man. Thank you, Ron DeSantis. Yeah, um, got an email here from Twinkle. Twinkle says, thank you. I feel smarter and more powerful every time I hear your voices. We are very fortunate to have you and this amazing community radio station. Love, Twinkle. Aww. Thank you, Twinkle. That's Aww. so nice. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's like, don't say what the don't say woke. And that that seems to be the phrase that is turning off everybody and and putting him uh, a distant second to our uh, very much indicted former president. <laughs> and so we really need people to get involved in their local election. There's a reason, and I'm saying this again, this is not something I said to you guys for the first time. There's a reason why uh, the uh, Ron DeSantis and his lieutenants have gone after school boards. Right. Right. Uh, the reason why uh, there's this new college debacle, there's a reason why uh, he is looking to move the curriculum of schools and universities to the right, because our children have figured out that uh, homophobia is not a thing. Uh, they figured out that racism benefits no one. They figured out that unchecked capitalism is oppressive. And the conversations that we're having in this country and the things we're fighting about have shifted to those things, even amongst the very young. And so what better place uh, than to stake your um, um, take to take uh, control of that discourse than by going back to the school board and redirecting. Uh, education, so that people are learning these fantastical things, right? Right, um, and so it's important when people are sitting and they're listening and they're hearing us complain and talk about all these things. But the one thing that came out of that conversation last night, we finally did decide that local elections are important. 
down to your school board, your county commission, your uh, mayor's races, your city councilors or county executives, they're always important. They never stop being important. All politics is local. That's where it begins. A lot of these people that we that end up in D.C. started in county commissions and mm-hmm. city councils. And so, guys, please don't sit out the local election. And I've said that many times. Yep. But I'm saying, again, that's the answer to the angst that these conversations and this type of episode bring up. <laughs> make sure you're not only participating, but that you're having conversations even with people that you don't agree on so that we can start to steer the public discourse in a better direction. Right. Well, Chris in Clearwater is on the line, so let's give him a shout. Hi, Chris. Hi, good morning, uh, ladies. Um, I'm about body positivity. Uh, I'm really concerned that it's taken off, I think, because of the subsidized uh, the food makers who are subsidized um, by government. And, uh, you know, most of their food's being allowed in the supermarket that's unedible that uh, I think people are normalizing. Um I wish uh, they'd subsidize organic farmers more, but uh, you know I don't. I wouldn't feel too positive looking at my blood work if it wasn't very good. And I want people to feel positive about them, their bodies. I just um, don't uh, understand how they might not be concerned about being there for their their fa- friends and family in the future. And then um, you know, trying to some of them might notice, try to lecture others on. Uh, if you just take this one medical remediation, then you'll be okay and you'll be safe from a virus. And, you know, they lecture us who have great immune systems and, you know, do a whole variety of things. They think it's a one-stop shot, and it's not. So so, so you're you're thinking maybe about the, the food additives, the high fructose corn mm-hmm. syrup, stuff like that? Pesticides, right. Pesticides are... Uh-oh. I'm afraid I lost Chris. I'm here. Yay, Donna's here. Yeah. I think I think probably what Chris was alluding to, yeah, food additives and things like that. I can't disagree with that. Um, Chris and I don't often land on the same page, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I do think he's right about that. I do think that the food additives, I mean, and the, you think about um, what what is affordable. You know, you can't afford fresh fruit and, and vegetables um, and meats. And so what what are your alternatives? Ramen noodles, pasta. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that um, that there is something to that. And we need to look at why. I mean, if if we're going to raise healthy folks, we need to f- feed them healthy meals. But if you don't make enough money to do anything but pay the rent and buy ramen noodles, I mean, you're kind of stuck in that situation. Yeah, but that all goes back to we create industries, right? We create a dialysis industry. You know, uh, we create uh, obesity industry. Uh, uh, bariatric medic- medicine industry, plastic surgery, all of these things, all of these uh, abuses. Yes. Uh, uh, and they serve capitalism. God, Donna, you're absolutely right. And now I'm so jaded. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I didn't even think of that. But yeah, yeah. that's why you, wanna, you want unhealthy pay- pill- people is so the people who own the medical stuff can fix them. Got it. Uh, you know, that came from, that was in Julius Caesar. Remember when Julius Caesar said that he did not want uh, lean men yes. around him? Yes, he has a lean and hungry look. Let's uh, talk to Anita. Hi, Anita. Hello. Hello. Hi, Anita. Hi. Um, I was just calling. I know y'all are talking about Ron DeSantis before I called the station and stuff. But I'm going back to Donald Trump. His it has to be quick, any Anita, because we're fixing to okay. run out of okay. time. His name should not be on any ballot trying to run for the presidency. That's all. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Bye. All right, so we are out of time, Donna. Thanks so much for for calling back in. And um, we will see you next week at 10 o'clock on Thursday. Bye. WMNF Tampa 88.5. I like stunning.
shining. I like shining. I like million dollar deals. Where's my pen? Bitch, I'm signing. I like those Balenciagas. The ones that look like socks. I like going to the Tula. I put rocks all in my watch. I like Texas from my exes when they want a second chance. I like proving wrong. I do what they say.